Welcome to episode 148 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing James V. Hart. His writing credits include the Steven Spielberg film Hook, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, and many, many more. James also created the Heart Chart, which is a screenwriting tool to help writers plot the emotional journey of their characters. We talk about all of this and much, much more on today's episode, so stay tuned for that. Today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by ScreenCraft.org. ScreenCraft and today's guest, James V. Hart, is running a master class, and the first 200 people to sign up will receive an exclusive invitation to the 25th birthday screening of James V. Hart's celebrated classic film, Hook, directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Robin Williams, Dustin Hoffman, and Bob Hoskins and Julia Roberts. Following the screening, there will be a special celebration with James Hart and the Lost Boys cast at Sony Pictures Studios, where the movie was filmed. This special screening takes place on the evening of Friday, November 11th, the evening before the weekend master class on November 12th and 13th. There is a generous 10% off coupon code to all SYS podcast listeners. That coupon code is capital S, capital C, 0916. And if you're a student, you can get half off by using the coupon code STUDENT. That's the word STUDENT in all caps. I'll put all of this in the show notes as well, or you can go directly to screencraft.org to register. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episode number 148. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide quick few words about what I'm working on. Once again, the main thing I'm trying to push through is post-production of my crime action thriller film, The Pinch. The rough cut is in. I watched the full rough cut last night and I'm excited to dig in and get things tightened up. So now at the so now for the next couple of weeks, I'll be spending a lot of time watching and rewatching the film and writing down notes on tweaks that need to be made. I'm probably going to be sick of this movie by the end of the week, but right now I'm really excited to just dig in and get to work. This is the fun part of the process. A lot of the hard, grueling work is done, and this part of the process is pretty creative. It's a lot of just watching the scenes and trying to figure out if we're using the right take or the right cut, if it could be shortened, tightened, all that kind of stuff. With this sort of budget, there's not really any way to do a lot of reshoots so we've got to make the best movie with the footage we have so it kind of you know it's creative but it's creative within a certain box anyway that's the main thing I'm working on for the next couple of weeks hopefully by you know let's say the end of November ish um, I will have a locked picture and then we'll start moving into a lot of the technical stuff after that there's the sound mix there's the music score color correction all that kind of stuff and that's very technical I would say not so much creative um, but this next month is going to be a lot of just working with the editor and, and getting the picture to be um, the best that we can make it so now let's move on to the main segment of the podcast. Today I'm interviewing screenwriter James V. Hart. Here is the interview. Welcome, Jim, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I'm glad we're both in the same time zone. There you go. So to start out, maybe you can give us a quick overview of your background, kind of how you got into the business, and um, you know, just bring us up, maybe even include a few of the highlights of your career. Um. Wow. Well, I did the I, I I did come into this business in uh, what they called the the greatest decade of American film, which was the 1970s, um, when so many of us were starting out straight out of film school and on the on the heels of Vietnam and um, the 60s that sort of framed all of us. But um, I mean, we 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 came to the business with no rules. We were making films. We were writing scripts. Um, 
I mean, I was hanging out with Dennis Hopper. Uh, Steven Spielberg was directing television. Um, Coppola had st started uh, Zoetrope up north and um, was trying to uh, you know, do THX 1138 with George Lucas. American Graffiti, I was offered American Graffiti. Uh, I had money in Texas and tried desperately to finance it. So you, you were having these kind of opportunities with kind of legends now. Um, and they were actually framing, we were, they were actually framing the, the future of this business. Mm -hmm. um, and it was exciting. It was a, a, a there were no rules. Mm -hmm. um, we were, they were being made up as we went along, and the studios were uh, seeing um, a, a new kind of cinema emerge from American filmmakers, um, influenced by the French New Wave, by Godard and Truffaut, and and uh, all the great Italian directors. Um, my film school in, in Dallas at SMU was a nothing film school. Yet we had people like George Roy Hill bring uh, the answer print of uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kids to our um, cinema school to show. Uh, we were the first college students to see the film. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, Arthur Hiller directed Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, uh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, no, not Arthur Hiller. Arthur Penn directed Bonnie and Clyde uh, uh, in Dallas in those days with. with um, Warren Beatty and whatever her name was, nobody knew who Faye Dunaway was. A lot of our students worked on the film. Hmm. So I had an amazing kind of education where um, we were out making movies. Uh, we didn't have um, Blacklist. We didn't have um, uh, Sundance. Uh, we didn't have workshops. We didn't have, you know, mentors. Uh, it was really, um, it was really, it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I think I learned, I mean, I produced my first film in Europe when I was 22 years old with no money and, and no understanding. And we learned under, we learned under fire. We produced in seven countries, 15,000 miles, you know, uh, learning how to pick up crews when we went and uh, it won a lot of awards. But that was my first film experience was producing a film in Europe. Hmm. It was 19, 1972. Wow. Now Tell me, so like with American Graffiti, you said you got offered that. What exactly does that mean? George Lucas was trying to write this story and, and you were somehow involved with that? There was a script written by Willard and Gloria Hike who had rewritten uh, George. Uh, George was uh, had come off of THX. Um, there was a wonderful agent here uh, at ICM, Jeffrey Bird, who went on to become legendary, who was trying to help George raise money. We had, were raising money out of Texas from my fraternity brothers and, and my high school buddies in venture capital to make movies. Uh, and uh, uh, the script was given to us. Um, and I fell in love with it. And I remember having a phone conversation with George Lucas at the Hollywood Vine Motel. Hmm. Um, he was trying to raise money, and nobody would give him any money. And um, we were unable to deliver the time that was needed. Um, and, uh, to Coppola's credit, uh, Coppola came to, uh, uh George's rescue and arranged for, uh, $750,000 to be put up for, uh, for George to go make the movie. And Terry Malick was trying to raise money for Badlands. Hmm. Uh, Terry and I were both from Texas, had a long conversation with Terry, sent him a DP, sent him a, uh, his, uh, production center, Jack Fisk told him how to raise the money. He went off and raised the money for Badlands. So it was that kind of climate. Uh, Last Picture Show had been made. Nobody knew anything about Last Picture Show um, uh, for a million dollars with um, an, uh, kind of an unknown cast and, and uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of some great careers. So it was a really exciting time yeah. to be and, getting into the and how were you meeting these folks? Um, you guys were just all hanging out, sort of in that Hollywood scene. How were you actually meeting these ty types? Of it people? was actually, it was actually very, it was just really interesting. There was such a, I mean, Scorsese used to have screening. He had a screening room at Warner Brothers that was dedicated to him. So on Friday nights, he would have screenings. There were no seats in the theater. We'd lay on the floor. Um, there, it was, a, it was a small, it was a small community that wasn't divided by agents and managers and lawyers at that time. We were all sort of young filmmakers trying to find our way. 
one of the real pieces of, of glue here was Kit Carson, L.M. Kit Carson, who um, really was groundbreaking in independent film. We lost him two years ago uh, out of Texas. Um, he uh, worked with some of the all the great young filmmakers coming out and was really, he was a journalist. He was also a filmmaker. And there was a lot of connections that way. There were just no walls between anybody. So you said you produced this film in the, um, it sounds like the early 70s. Um, when did you make the, the move? Were you always writing? And when did you kind of decide, okay, I'm going to be a screenwriter versus a producer or director or any number of other things? Um, in the late 70s, um, we were, I was going to come back and make some other independent films. Uh, but I was also just getting annoyed with the scripts I was reading. I had written plays and short stories in college and never thought of, the possibility of even having a writing career. I didn't, you know, it didn't occur to me that somebody wrote the screenplay for Robin Hood, you know, my favorite Errol Flynn film, uh, until I got in the business of it. And I began to read, 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 and go, wait a minute, I can do this. And I would begin to fix scripts on my own. And I finally wrote my first script under a pseudonym um, called The Frat Rats, which became um, sort of a challenge to Animal House and ended up in a big lawsuit. But I sat down and wrote uh, in pencil on yellow pads uh, about my experiences in college and the fraternity, um, put somebody else's name on it, and circulated it. And the reaction I got was encouraging to me. Uh, they didn't know it was me. Um, and then I started writing. Um, I wrote my first produced screenplay in 1978. Uh, it was about my... my uh, kind of raunchy days as a male cheerleader in Texas that was in, in a, a very bad film called Give Me an F, uh, or I think they changed the title to, um, uh, what was it? It was uh, TNA Camp Part 2 or something, came kind of a cult classic, um, and put me on the road to wanting to write bigger and more significant uh, material in the sci-fi and fantasy mm -hmm. uh, genre. So on this... So on, it, took me, it took me a while to get there. Yeah. So on this script that you wrote, Frat Rat, and you said you circulated, what exactly does that mean? You circulated, you just, you knew enough people in the business, so you started handing it out by, to them? By that point, by that point, you knew enough, some producers, a couple of agents, you know, uh, uh, someone could get it to a certain director. Um... By that time, you, you you had access to certain people without really having to go through. I finally got uh, partnered up with William Kirby, with Bill Kirby, who wrote some great films in the 70s and 80s. Um, and as and Bill, he wrote The Rose and uh, uh, Smokey and the Bandit and, and Hooper. and He just wrote some great stuff. And um, after working with me, he said, I'm the last... So I'm, you're the la you're the, this is the last time you're not going to be writing your own screenplays. Um, so I started writing in the 80s. Dracula was one of the first screenplays I tried. I wrote, um, and then I began to get hired in development deals. I wrote for everybody. I wrote for Frank Marshall and uh, Spielberg. I wrote for Redford and Newman. I wrote for um, uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the leading producers in the business, but nothing was getting made. So I was a development deal junkie. I could raise my kids, live in New York, uh, have a wall full of screenplays, and no movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was that it, in, in those days they just they would throw money at a good idea or uh, you know uh, something that sounded right or the possibility of going to an actor. Um, and I had some good teachers. I had some very good producers that I worked with that were really good creative producers. So let's talk about, John, John, I'm sorry, go ahead. John Abnett, John Abnett is the name I was trying to think of. John Abnett, great producer, great writer and director who was very encouraging to me. Yeah, yeah. So let's um, talk about your writing process a little bit. Um, one of the things I always like to just ask writers is um, to get a sense of sort of how they go about approaching material in terms of outlining, in terms of actually opening final draft and writing. How much time do you spend in the preparation phase, outlining, preparing, thinking about it versus how much time actually in final draft writing script pages? Um, and also don't forget, um, the last thing I do, the very last thing I do is is hit the screenplay. Uh, and by that point, I have outlined, I have charted, I have 
done treatments. I have done treatments and treatments and treatments that get longer and longer and longer. So that when you finally get to the screenplay stage, it really, I really try to make that a mechanical process where you take history and the, and the, you know, the magic can put it in a bottle on the shelf when you need it. But the actual screenplay process, you're always writing from something you're adapting, another written page, that you're adapting what you've written to a screenplay format. So I'm not just sitting there trying to start with that all rigid, all restrictive, all confining format of writing a screenplay. Um, that's the last thing I want to do is write the script. And then, hopefully, it flows. It's mechanical. There's still surprises. There's still magic. There's still things that happen. But if you've done your prep work, just like going to shooting a film, you don't just go out and start shooting a movie. You prep it. So I've tried to approach my writing process the way somebody like Francis Coppola approaches prepping to shoot a film. The last thing you do is make the movie. Um, and I know a lot of people say, oh, I just sit down and write. I just, I, oh, I just go. And I don't, I, one, I don't believe that. Uh, I know that uh, Frank Darabont said he wrote the script for Shawshank Redemption in six weeks, but I know he, for a fact, he thought about that script for 10 years. Um, so I think prep is everything. Mm -hmm. Research, prep, outline, 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 pro, uh, treatment, 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 and now uh, the charting process I started about 15 years ago that really charts the emotional journey of my characters for a, for a character-driven narrative as opposed to a plot-driven mm -hmm. narrative. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get to that here in a minute. Um, what is your writing schedule like? Um, do you have like a set schedule? You get up in the morning and you try and spend a certain number of hours writing. Um, just what does your sort of daily schedule look like? Well, I've been writing since 5 a.m. this morning Pacific time. Um, I have a rule where it's, you know, I'm called what I call a wugu, a W-U-G-U. Uh, wake up, get up. Um, a wonderful screenwriter gave me that piece of advice a long time ago, and that I I am very early to rise and very early to work because I can have four or five hours of writing in my belt before the rest of the world is up. Uh, and if you're laying in bed trying to go back to sleep, your brain woke you up. And if you're laying in bed trying to go back to sleep and not write, you're burning writing time. You're burning brain power, and you're not getting any result out of it. So I usually, I usually end up working by 6 a.m. I will work until about 1. Uh, I'll take a break. I'll come back around 3 or 4 and, and go till midnight or 1 in the morning. So I don't sleep very much. But um, uh, and that's, that's every day when I'm stationary. I'll ride on an airplane. I'll ride on a train. I'll ride in a hotel room. It doesn't matter. But that early morning wake up has become my sort of... Um, um, mantra, mm -hmm. wake up, get up. Uh, and it's very peaceful. Nobody's bothering you. It's interesting when you're in New York, LA is asleep and London thinks it's too early to call you. Um, and so you really get five, six, seven hours that you really are isolated from the rest of the world as, as a writer. Yeah. Yeah. And you're consistently doing that. Even if you don't have like a writing assignment or, um, something that you're being paid to write, will you just start writing a spec just to keep that that routine going. Well, I'm always writing. I mean, you you are constantly in television these days. You better be generating ideas, and you better be coming up with uh, TV projects you want to sell. Mm -hmm. And if you're waiting around for an assignment, uh, there's about twenty five thousand other people ahead of you. Um, and I've I've always kind of been a self generator, although I do get assignments. But yeah, no, I'm never not writing. Yeah. You're always you. Need to be working. You need to be working on something, whether it's your own or somebody else's or an idea. Um, yeah, no, I'm never not right. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, and, and I really appreciate what you're saying about outlining, and I think especially newer writers tend to jump the gun and get into final draft way too early. One of the things that I've run into, and I know other writers face this as well, in the outlining process when you're thinking, one of the problems I have is it it you get done the day and you don't feel like you've really accomplished anything. And I know intellectually I can sit back and say, yes, I did, I thought about this and I thought about that. But at least when you're in final draft, you know, there's like a page count that you can look back on and show some sense of accomplishment. Um, how do you deal with that? It's just, it feels very demoralizing sometimes if you spend a week just thinking about your script and not actually producing pages. Um, do you find that to be true and, and how do you deal with that? Um, I taught at Columbia and I taught at NYU for 
for years. Uh, my kids were both there, uh, and I found their their entire measure of progress in screenwriting was page count, which I just think is is a, a false positive. There there is no um, equation that equates page count to good screenwriting. It just doesn't. Um, some days I'll produce one page. Some days I'll produce fifteen. Uh, uh, the page count thing is not a measure for me on how uh, on the progress I'm actually making. Uh, the craft um, rules and craft toolkits that I have developed over the years have given me a way to break story that forces me to break story and forces me to answer questions that end up giving me a character-driven narrative as opposed to plot-driven. So. I don't sit around and face blank pages. I might write some shitty ones, but I'm not facing a blank page in the treatment or outline stage, just not. Um, and it is nice to say, hey, I did five pages today, or hey, I did 10 pages today, but it's nicer of me to say, I figured this out. I figured out where I have to collapse. I figured out what, the, you know, I figured it out. Now, the next day, I can go uh, address that. But I would be very careful, at least for me, about measuring my progress and, and success in, in storytelling with page count. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let's, I think that's a good segue. Let's now talk about um, the heart chart a little bit. Um, maybe you can start out by just kind of giving us an overview of what that is. And I will link to the website so people can learn more about it. I'll put that in the show notes. Um, but maybe you can kind of give us an overview of this heart chart that you've developed. Yeah, thank you. Um, the heart chart was born at the Austin Film Festival and uh, at uh, the Equinox Writing Workshops about 15 years ago. And it's a story mapping tool that actually is a visual graph of the emotional journey each of your characters are going on through a series of narrative signposts. So you can actually track the heartbeat. You can track the emotional up and down success and failure of your character and see it as opposed to it being cards on a wall, which I have a hard time with. I never know where I really am emotionally in the journey when I'm looking at cards on the wall. An outline, you turn a page, you turn a page, and you maybe have forgotten something. You see it over here in Act 1 that you want to pay off in Act 3. And I started it because um, writers were having a hard time with structure, and they, they were running out of gas on page 30 or 40. Uh, and I started the chart to begin to show them where they were succeeding and where they were failing and where they needed shoring up and where they needed a paint job or a flat tire fix. Uh, and I did it, you know, on whiteboards and on, on paper. Um, so everybody would make their own chart of their own draft. It started out as a rewrite tool. You take a draft of something you've written and then before you rewrite it, you apply all the heart chart diagnostics to it. It's a diagnostic tool. Mm -hmm. You plug in your car and see what's wrong with the engine. So two years ago, and I've been doing it at the AFF for years. It was became we went from twenty people to two hundred people in the, in the heart chart session. And I would do other films that weren't my own. I did The Martian, Dallas Buyers Club, Imitation Game. Uh, I mean, Graham Morris was blown away by how much more I knew about his screenplay than than he did. Um, two years ago, I was approached by Guy Goldstein, who developed the writer's duet. He came to one of my sessions in Austin and said, "I can do that as an act." where you can actually have it on your computer. So it's your traveling whiteboard. It's something that goes with you everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I had been being asked for years, can you please do this as an app? And I just never did it. Mm -hmm. So Guy developed the app last year, and we launched it at the, at the AFF uh, in 2015. Um, and it now it is, I carry it with me everywhere. Uh, I started out by using the app as a rewrite tool. Now I use it to break story. Uh, I have directors that have used it because it's visual. They can actually see on the, on one page their entire film, where they're supposed to be emotionally. I have actors that are using it to chart their character's journey through a script or a play that they're doing. Um, I had a group of uh, uh, Irish uh, actors and an Irish playwright who were having a hard time getting the play to work, so they took the heart chart and all the questions that come with it, and they improvised the play to the heart chart and rewrote the play from the improvisations mm. and it worked so uh, we're now trying it on a TV season look at what can you do the heart chart for an entire season can you apply those narrative story mapping tools and see where you are in mid-season where you are in episode 6 
with your character's journey. Um, I've had novelists use it. I used it on my first novel. And it's, it is a serious writer's tool. I think it's very helpful for threshold writers who may be having a hard time following <coughs> McKee or, or some of the other kinds of uh, applications that are more text-driven. This forces you to write. This makes you write. And it gives you the chance for you to decide on whether this is good or bad for your character, what degree is it good or bad, is it progress, is it a setback, what's the emotional state my character is in, but you see it, you don't read it. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you mentioned that you've done a bunch of um, movies like The Martian and stuff. Do you ever plug in one of those movies and find major flaws with a movie that was even a studio level movie that may even have been successful or is there some correlation like when the heart chart shows issues those movies maybe didn't do as well well the heart chart will reveal uh deficiencies or problems uh in the film uh i i i've charted three blockbusters that were huge that were dismal on the chart and when i got when i when i engaged my uh seminar so let's identify these points in this existing film. They couldn't do it. Uh, it. It did not. It it did not. They were having a hard time pulling out the story points that they could explain to somebody. Um, so it does. It does show you a deficiency, but it also shows you where your strengths are, where you might need a tune-up. Mm -hmm. Like if you had a character interact one, the chart will tell you how long that character is off screen. And that may be an essential character that you need for deeper in your narrative. And you realize, oh, my God, I haven't, been, I haven't seen him for 25 pages. You know? yeah. So you, it, it, makes you, it shows you a blueprint of where you're at. Or it's how you break story in the beginning. So hopefully you can head off some of these problems before you get to the editing room. Mm -hmm. I started this after Dracula. Uh, Francis gave me uh, the, the three magic questions that started me on this kind of character-driven journey. I now have eight to ten magic questions that you do before you start the chart. But we had to go back in Dracula and not reshoot, but shoot pieces of narrative that somehow the screenplay had we missed in the writing. And only when the footage became living and breathing did we begin to see, okay, we need this piece of narrative, we need this piece of narrative. Not reshooting a scene, mm -hmm. but adding new pieces of narrative. So this is when I started the chart with after Dracula. Dracula was the first movie I put to the test, and it did follow the, it followed the chart beautifully, but it wasn't necessarily how the script had been written. Hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah. So my theory, my theory was, can we, do, can we follow the heartbeat of our characters in the written stage and maybe head off some of these problems that we're going to face in the editing room, especially in an independent film where you don't have money to go back and reshoot, you don't have money to go... Add new scenes. You know what you got. You what you got is what you, what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. So, especially in a, in a lower budget uh, um, medium, or where where you're in TV and you're on such a tight schedule, and you don't have time to go back. Uh, hopefully, it helps you head off some of those problems before you get to the editing room and before you start production. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if you could just give us an example of, of one or two of those eight magic questions you're talking about, just so we can kind of get a sense of what it's all about. Well, I can give you the first three questions, and then the, the ones that come after that are on the chart. Perfect. Um, the first three questions, and these are, seem very rudimentary and very basic and very screenwriter 101, but just remember, these are the questions that Francis Ford Coppola gave to me. So I pay attention when they come from his source. Uh -huh. the, first, the first question is... Uh, who is my main character, and what do they want when we meet them? Very simple. Uh, but what is want? Want is usually ego-driven, I, 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 me, me, me. It's usually material. But if you don't know what your character wants that's going to drive them through this narrative, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And it can, be, it can be very simple. You know, I, it's, uh, I want a new car. I want to cut school, you know. I want to go to the dance with so and so. I want to move. I, I want to move to London and, and find new blood to suck. You know, um, uh, what does uh, uh, Matt Damon want in The Martian? Everybody says he wants to go home. No. He wants to learn how to survive for three point three years until the second 
probe, the second ship comes and lands in another location. You know, so as soon as you are able to identify what your main character wants, you then have a motor that's going to drive your narrative. Mm -hmm. Second question, um, who are the relationships and what are the obstacles my main character has to encounter to get what they want? And you literally list, you know, they're, they're, them, they're their own worst enemy, they're their own worst obstacle, uh, their nagging mother, the evil stepmother, Darth Vader, uh, the hurricane is about to strike the ship. I mean, you literally start listing obstacles that your main character has to go through to get what they want. What does Indiana Jones want uh, uh, in uh, the, 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 good, the good first one? Raiders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He wants the Ark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if he, now, if he found the Ark in Act 1, movie's over, you know. Um, the last question is a trick question. This is the one I made Francis say to me three or four times. In the end, does my main character get what they want or not get what they want? And is it good or bad for them if they did or didn't? Dot, dot, dot. Did they get what they need? And that's the one you really have to pay attention to. Because sometimes pursuing what we want is not good for us. Mm -hmm. But you can't discover what you need unless you pursue what you want. Need being that inner wound, that inner um, fear, that inner... Uh, 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 angst, that inner inner part of you that is desperate to get out and be discovered. Um, it's the Rolling Stones. I'm sorry, <laughs> you, know, yeah. you can't you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you just might find you get what you need. You have to try to get what you want in order to discover what you really need, and that's what drives characters through any story. It's that want, that ego, that selfish, that um, possessive. That me, 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 that I need to, you know, that's what drives narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at some point, that want is going to get you in a shitload of trouble, but it's going to lead you to what you need. And as soon as I started thinking about those, that's how I started. And, and if you answer those questions before you even open Final Draft, if you answer those questions, you will have created a character-driven narrative as opposed to a plot-driven narrative. So your character will be pulling you through the narrative, the story, instead of the writer pushing us through the story with plot. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found I had been doing. I was relying too much on plot, thinking that's what's important is plot, as opposed to character. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and now I now I I start from a completely totally character driven POV. Look what they did in Westworld this season uh, when they shifted the focus to the robots giving them um, emotions and giving them a POV and, get, and, get, and putting us in their shoes as opposed to the shoes of the, uh, you know, all the asshole guests who come to kill people. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the robots have, an, we have, an, suddenly we have empathy for the robot. You know, so <clears throat> that's character. Uh, anyway, those, those three questions led me to the chart. And then I began to add questions over the years. So now we have about eight or ten questions that you have to answer before you start charting or before you start. In, in, in answering those questions, you have actually written a narrative. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your, um, as I said, that's that's all great stuff. And I, and I will link to the um, to the heart chart in the show notes so people can, can learn more about that. Let's talk about your master class um, coming up. It's on the weekend of November 12th and 13th at the Los Angeles Film School. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. But, well, it actually starts November the 11th. Okay. Uh, this is the 25th anniversary of Hook. Okay. Uh, which is my first kind of really big kind of breakthrough. Um and we're having a screening at the Sony lot in the Cary Grant Theater for the first 200 uh, registrants that sign up for the seminar. The Lost Boys are going to be there. Dante Bosco, who played Rufio, will be there. We're having a big birthday party to celebrate 25 years of Hook. So that's how we're starting the weekend. Mm -hmm. And then on the 12th and 13th, we're at the uh, at L.A. Film School uh, doing an immersion into the use and the demonstration of the heart chart. Uh, we will do the heart chart for Hook. I will do the heart chart for the Martian or uh, imitation game on Sunday. Um, and um, we'll also be doing some interaction with um, participants in getting them to use the chart on their own work uh, and share that with the group. 
um, and it's 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 it is a, an expansion of what I've been doing for years in Austin uh, and in Europe. I've done the heart chart all over Europe, and it's the first time we brought it to with ScreenCraft, who who have been an incredible um, organization. I wish I'd had when I started out. Um, uh, bringing uh, new way new ways and, and and ways that work to help the screenwriter um, get their screenplays and their scripts and market ready. It's not going to write it for you. You still have to do the writing, but it's a tool that's worked for me uh, and saved my ass on many occasions. And um, hopefully, we'll be sharing it with a number of. Uh, of writers and colleagues uh, in LA. Mm -hmm. And is there a particular type of writer that this is good for, like, you know, beginners versus experts? Um, can everybody, er, every screenwriter benefit from this, you think? Well, I, there, most of the experts, or I should say expert, most of the professionals that, that have been in this business a while have their own method. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their own toolkit, their own skill set. I have found this to be extremely helpful to threshold writers and, and early writers in developing a method so they're not that gives them an actual toolkit that works. Mm -hmm. so they can, I've seen them. I've seen them uh, when we did the Writers Ranch in Austin in the late '90s and, and early 2000s. Um, within within three hours, within four hours, writers were solving their own problems. Threshold writers. And helping their colleagues solve their problems by using the questions in the chart. And had I not, and I, and I, I've seen it over and over and over again. I have students from Columbia from back in 2001 that are in the in the profession now. They're doing very well. They've directed. They've written. They've won Pulitzer prizes. They still use the chart. Uh, it's become part of their methodology and part of their even. And I still use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, this is not something I just. Do a seminar and walk away. You know, uh, I use this every single day in my work um, in order to to keep that lightning in the bottle whenever I need it. So I think it's great for threshold writers, and it's great for anybody who's doing a rewrite and they've they've and they've not found a way to analyze what it is the rewrite needs. You get notes from everybody. You get several opinions. You get ah well we don't let you know. If you take the chart and use it for your rewrite, I think you'll find it very revelatory and constructive in making certain decisions mm -hmm. and you, about what you need. And you mentioned earlier that you had started to apply it to um, TV. Do you find that it's yeah. as helpful in TV writing as for feature writing? This is a brand new uh, application for television. What we're doing, we're taking the chart and having it be the whole season instead of one episode. And looking at what, what does episode one need to do on the chart? What is it? What's the mid-season episode need to do on the chart? What's the point in there? What's the what's number six in, in the eight part mini uh, you know limited series going to do? Mm -hmm. And also it but you, this, you follow the character through an entire season as opposed to following the character through a two-hour uh, film. So you're still applying the same principles, but you're following the character over a longer arc. And it's been I've used it in Europe where you have two writers rooms in Europe that are using it. Um, and I'm starting to try to, whatever the next show is that I'm lucky enough to do, I'm hoping to be able to introduce the chart to the room. So it gives us a story map of the whole season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, as I said, I'm going to round up the links. I will get the ScreenCraft link for the Masterclass. I will get the Heart Chart link and put those in the show notes. Um, I always like to just end the interviews by asking the guests um, how people can kind of follow along with what you're doing. If you're on Twitter or Facebook or have a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, um, you can say that now. And again, I'll add it to the show notes, but you can tell us about that now, and then maybe people can kind of keep up with what you're doing. Yeah, there is a Heart Chart Facebook page. Uh, you can also follow me on, uh, you go to ScreenCraft Facebook page, you'll see Heart Chart announcements. I'm on Twitter at the Heart Chart. Um, and uh, there we try to keep people informed about what's happening and when. And I would urge everybody, uh, November 11th and 12th and 13th will be here pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, go in and register and sign up. They, there's a discount that they're carrying from the Austin Film Festival that's available. Uh, there are student discounts, um, and you get that free screening of Hook uh, on the Sony lot uh, with the Lost Boys. And uh, Sunday, Saturday's all day, and we'll have a reception at the end of Saturday, a hangout. Sunday is over at 2, um, so everybody can make their way back home. And this is an experiment um, uh, to see um, if, if working writers and writers that are in 
in this in the LA area who are breaking into the business uh, to see if we can if if the story mapping tool makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, well, Jim, I really appreciate your coming on the show and talking with me today. Excellent interview, and um, I wish you luck with with both the heart chart and this master class. It sound interesting, and I think a lot of screenwriters can benefit from it. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, my 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 parting phrase is go with gravity. Let gravity take you to good places, not bad places. That's a good call. So, thank you again, Jim. Thank you. Perfect. Take care. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Just want to mention two things I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters find producers who are looking for material. First, I've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. Every member of SYS Select can submit one logline per newsletter. I went and emailed my large database of producers and asked them if they would like to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, I have well over 350 producers who have signed up to receive it. These producers are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch newsletter and get your script into the hands of lots of producers sign up at selling your screenplay select.com again that's selling your screenplay select.com and secondly I've partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads sites so I can syndicate their leads to SYS select members there are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner recently I've been getting 10 to 12 high quality paid leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or are looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas. Producers are looking for shorts, features, TV and web series pilots. It's a huge array of different types of projects that these producers are looking for. And these leads are exclusive to our partner and SYS Select members. To sign up, go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Paul Schrader. Last week, I mentioned that Craig Van Sickle would be on today's podcast, but I had to move him back. I wanted to publish today's episode with James before the master class so people could learn about that. And then, as I said, I have an interview next week with Paul Schrader. Paul is a long, he's been um, writing scripts since the early 70s. He wrote the script for um, Taxi Driver, many other great scripts um, he's written. And he has a new film coming out starring Nicolas Cage and Willem Dafoe called Dog Eat Dog. So we dig into that film, but we also talk about some of the other aspects of his career and just some general screenwriting advice. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Jim. I think there was a lot of great points, um, a lot of really interesting stuff from Jim, but I want to just pull out a couple of things that I found particularly interesting. I think it's a great lesson to hear him talk about his writing routine. He's writing every day for many, many hours. If you haven't already done so, please look him up on IMDb. Again, that's James V. Hart. I mean, he's had a career spanning decades. And listen to what he said. He's always writing for many, many hours per day and always producing new work. He's not sitting around waiting for his agent to call with a writing assignment. He's writing new stuff and trying to make things happen for himself. And this is a guy who's been doing it for decades. And really listen to that. He's an established writer, many, many big movies on his resume, and he's still out there trying to just generate work and get things going. And listen to the warning he gave in in the interview where he said, you know, if you just wait around for writing assignments and you're not always generating new material, that could be a potentially big problem for any writer. And again, this is coming from someone who's successful and has a long, long career. I feel like so many new writers have this idea in their heads that if they could just sell that first script, things would get a lot easier. And maybe sometimes that happens, but that's not always the case. And I think James is a prime example. You just have to keep working. It's not going to be about selling one script or two script or three script. You know, a career spans, like James has shown, many, many decades. And you need to get into the routine of working hard and constantly generating new material. I also thought it was super interesting hearing Jim talk about the early 70s film scene. These guys were out there raising money and making movies. I often feel like a lot of these services today are in some ways just a distraction. And I include my own services here at SYS in this group. George Lucas, again, listen to what Jim was saying. George Lucas wasn't uploading his scripts to the blacklist or ink tip, and he wasn't using the SYS email and fax blast service. He was out there trying to raise money to shoot his film. 
that's super hard work and it's a lot of work writers simply don't want to do which I think is a big mistake obviously I think the SYS services are fantastic I wouldn't sell them if I didn't I've used the blacklist in the past I continue to use inktip to this day so I think all of these services have their place I think these services can be a part of your screenwriting marketing plan but they shouldn't be the entire marketing plan I'm also out there writing directing and producing my own film and I think you should be doing this as well I've talked about this in the podcast many times in the past if you don't have any production experience whatsoever get out your iPhone get a few friends and just start shooting films and seeing where that leads with each terrible short film that you do you will get better and better you'll start to understand what it takes to shoot a feature film and it really won't be long before you're ready for that anyway once again I just want to mention the masterclass with Jim it's the weekend of November 12th and 13th here in Los Angeles and again there's a generous 10% off coupon code to all SYS podcast listeners that coupon code is capital S as in Steve capital C is in Charlie 0916 and if you're a student you can get half off by using the coupon code student that's the word student in all caps I'll link to it in the show notes but you can also go directly to screencraft.org to learn more about it and sign up anyway that's the show thank you for listening